Number 99 of 100, we're almost home. Um, this one, I want to get away from the nuts and bolts of playing on a gig and stuff and talk about what, what it's like. I get questions from students all the time, what it's like to be on certain gigs um, in my experience. And not to talk blab about me too much, but it's interesting how um, the performer sees it a lot differently than others in the audience do sometimes. It's not as glorious as one thinks. When Gamelon did a tour with the sax great Ernie Watts, we were on the tour bus with him. Um, we were thinking, oh man, you were on a tour bus? Yes, we did about 12 dates with the tour bus and it was an old bus and it smelled like gas fumes in the back and it was not that glorious of an experience. Um, it was cool to be hanging with Ernie. Um, we asked him, what was it like to play with the Stones? He was on tour with the Stones and he said, well, he said, it wasn't a whole lot different than other gigs. I realized that the, the bigger the production, the higher the payroll. <laughs> He always had something like, it's not that great. It was very organized, he said. You know, we fly to gigs and that kind of stuff. But even playing with the Stones wasn't all his dream or anything, you know. Um, and people ask me, what was it like to play Newport Jazz Festival? I actually did. Um, when Gamelon was first hitting back in the late 80s, I think this was, we were a new band and we had an aggressive, small, a medium-sized record company, Amherst Records, who had had Spyro Gyra and another, and Glenn Medeiros, I think it had hit with him, and the Tonight Show Orchestra were on their roster, um, and uh, they knew the buttons to press to push us. We were an unknown band, and they got us all the way to number eight in the Billboard Jazz Tires just by three guys they paid minimum wage making phone calls and getting the stuff shipped to the right stores. That was the game back then. So, yes, we could stand up and play, and we got the gig at Newport, which is a wonderful thing because the record company pushed us there, and we were kind of nervous. They go, oh, my God, this is the big time, right? We better be ready. We better have our gear ready, our sounds. We were there, and then we got to this great big amphitheater, and uh, it's an outdoor thing. There's lawn seats up there and a big, you know, maybe a amphitheater that maybe fits four or five, 6,000 people in it. And then the rest is lawn seats, outdoor seats. The people there for a lawn seat got there early with their blankets to get a good spot. We went on. All of a sudden, you know, like the show was start, supposed to start at like 4 o'clock or something like that. And uh, all of a sudden, the promoters are telling us to go on. And it's only like 20 to 4. We're going, like, what? It doesn't even start yet. This is a real real life. It turns out that we were the regional new guy favorites that were sent up to make sure the PA worked. That's how we saw it. So it kind of deflated the ego about it and the nerves about it. It's like, okay, so we'll go up now, you know. Uh, they were worried about getting behind later, so they sent up the, the, you know, the sacrificial lambs, us, to play. Now, we still played, we still played our stuff, but the weird part about it was that we had this sea of empty seats in front of us and about 40,000 people on the lawn behind us that we were told were going crazy, which we could barely hear. It was surreal. So we, yes, I did play the Newport Jazz Festival. It's on my resume. I was really there. I did hang backstage with Carl Santana and Miles Dave. We were back behind stage with these people and we had a pass and that kind of stuff. It was, it was an awesome experience. And... Yes, it's on my resume, but the reality of it was not every gig is so illustrious. Um, it was kind of weird to play, and some of the people from the lawn seats kind of filtered down in the first few rows. It was like we are playing just for them. <laughs> it was like really deflating in that way. We did it, and uh, we played well, and from what I'm told, the audience went nuts. We could barely hear them. So um, it's kind of weird. Not every gig is what you think it is. Um, other people ask me, too, what's it like to play in front of a symphony? That was pretty cool. When I played with Bob Eek, um, we were a local band. We were doing well. We were in the newspaper all the time. Other bands were jealous, like, man, how are you guys getting all this press? We'd be on the, you know, my dad would say, hey, you're on the front page, on above the fold. That's pretty good. Um, that's, that's the coveted spot. We were like, good thing we weren't criminals. We were in the news all the time. It was, became this gypsy jazz craze in the town of Buffalo in the 2005 through 2010. And we were the kings of it. It was kind of interesting. Um, and the local symphony, the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra, they're a major symphony orchestra. Um, the, the conductor, um, happened to be our rhythm guitarist and, and vocalist, um, father-in-law was a real estate guy who sold the, the conductor of the symphony at a house. And he goes, you got to hear my son, my, my, my son-in-law is, and he's going, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But he said, I did listen to the CD and you guys were awesome. So he came out to the gig and said, we want to do a show with you in the symphony. So we had a professional charts made and, um, and played with the Buffalo Philharmonic. We played with a number of other symphonies after that with the same charts. It was an interesting thing um, to be able to play in a symphony hall. It's a whole different vibe than a, than a gig, local gig. When we played our local gigs, 
we would stretch out tunes as long as we needed, you know, but the symphony is like, it's got to be right. The symphony will not follow if you take an extra chorus. It's got to be the arrangement. We had to practice the arrangement, which was a little bit anti-jazz for me. So it's a little bit high pressure in that regards, but I loved it. I love standing in front of that symphony and going, I'm up here. You're not. Ha ha. A little bit puffing myself up in my mind. All my family there, you know, that I haven't seen in years. A lot of them, they all came out of the woodworks to see me on this illustrious gig. Finally soloing like my teacher did, Dennis Prevarsky, back in the 70s. Here I was in the 2000s, also in, in the same position. I was very proud. I remember my little uh, four-year-old grandson. That's my pop up there. You know, those like these wonderful moments for me. And uh, it's you now some are a little higher pressure. The band was a little nervous, but we played well and did did a good job. It's much more um, pressurized and static to do those kind of gigs. So some are loose, some are cool, some are not. Some are you think are going to be cool, and some aren't. That's the way the world goes. Keep humble, stay with it, and do your best at all times, and don't get flustered. And remember, it's just you're serving whoever's listening. And maybe whoever's listening is not even physical. It might be just the angels or your your uh, ancestors, for all we know, listening to you play. So I hope you enjoyed these things. I'm going to do one more video about other violinists that you should look at. And um, hit me up for some lessons or something. Or come to the site and join us.